Salutations. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, guys. This is a response video to some of the responses that have been written in particularly. I think there was one really well detailed out point by point response to my last video about Stargate and religion and stuff. Uh, I'll link that in, in the section down below so you can go back and see that video. But uh, I thought I would take some time to since that person had taken so much time, thank you, Fed Guy, for really writing out some very detailed thoughts. I would respond to that and maybe possibly some others, depending on the time. But I'm going to start with, with Fed Guy because there's a, a lot there, and I think he covers a lot of points that probably some of the other uh, comments do. And rather than going back and forth in comments, it's easier for me just to speak from the hip and, and, and put this into a video rather than, than, than type it all out. So uh first comment was hey your opening premise is flawed sg1 is not anti-religious at all the whole false god storyline in the show would be false gods even to theists unless your definition is a god uh, is a humanoid whose conscious has been taken over by an evil parasite using advanced technology to trick their worshipers into subjugation i i get all of that right you can make an argument uh, against a theology by using a proxy that is superficially similar to, you know, that religion and and then counter arguing against it. And that's the whole point of that video. Of course, this guy is not a direct stand in for God and and um, and whatever have you. My point is, is that a lot of my atheist friends still see that as a as a stand-in for religion, and then Daniel Jackson is making a very strong counter-religious argument. I wasn't the one who picked this video out as some sort of straw man argument against atheism. This video was chosen by an atheist friend to better uh, communicate their feelings of why they could never become a Christian. And in this clip, Daniel Jackson is arguing with an alien who in many ways, superficially at least, is representing many of the aspects of religion in general and Christianity specifically, as I pointed out in my video. So that's why I use this. Now, uh, on a whole, as a broad argument or whatever have you, and I've said this you know, plenty of times uh, in the past, is um, uh, the, the, the overall science fiction shows are very humanistic, especially, you know, Star Trek uh, and Stargate and a few others uh, in their messaging. And as such, in order to communicate and drive that that point home, why their their writers or, or, you know, whatever, really strongly believed in that humanism message that humanity is going to rise above its own problems without the aid of, of God and, and whatever, there was a lot of these proxy arguments uh, and, and whatnot. And I think, again, talking with people decades later, and this happened back then, but I still see the effects decades later, where I see those exact arguments that were used in those shows, even though they were used against aliens and other proxies, uh, used as the counter-Christian argument. So that's why I use this and I made the argument the way that I did. Uh, he goes on to say, I actually do not recall a single anti-Christian, anti-Muslim, anti-Hindu, Jewish sentence being being spoken the entire 10 seasons. I've watched them all less than, no less than four times. Again, I get it. You can make an argument by using a proxy, right? I, I can sit here and say, um, I, uh, you know, I'm anti-violent video games because I think that makes people violent. But instead, I'm going to make this science fiction show, but instead of using violent video games, I'm going to use another form of entertainment that has a lot of violence. And it might be real live arena battles. It might be violent books. Uh, it, it might be uh, some other sort of video game that maybe doesn't have strong violence in it, but has something else that's detrimental. Um, like bad behavior or whatever have you. And then I demonstrate how that's affecting the culture. Or I demonstrate how my heroes are arguing against why this is so bad without ever saying the words, you know, violent video games. You can do these proxy type of arguments. People people do it all the time so that, that the people uh, don't feel directly um, attacked. Uh, you can, uh, yeah. And in fact, sci-fi is really, really good at this, by the way. They managed to attack racism, for example, without always blatantly saying it's racist, right? They'll they'll have a show where, for example, um, people are discriminating against each other on the basis other than their 
skin color or something along those lines, and they'll use some other, you know, proxy for that. It's 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 not uh, that different without ever using the word race. You know, might be might be their uh, might be their hair color, which has nothing to do really necessarily with you know your race or your place of origin. Who, who knows? Daniel Jackson shown as a person that respects the histories of religion. Right. He's he's a proper, you know, he's a good scientist atheist, right? He respects their place, but he'll never, of course, believe in them. The Ori are not representative deities, they represented false deities. They were not the first species and did not and did not create the universe that they pretend that they did. I know, but again, they're presenting that argument from that distinct perspective, even if what they're saying is a lie. The person watching the clip doesn't know that. The atheist friend who sent that to me may not even know any of that. You may not watch the whole series. None of that context really will matter to the person who's watching that clip. And honestly, even the person who's watching the whole show who does understand that particular context may still feel like, you know what? I understand the context. I understand they're not calling out Christians directly, but dang nabbit, if that isn't a good reason not to believe in the Bible and the God of the Bible. Because a lot of those arguments that are being made against this alien that's being controlled evilly sounds an awful lot like a christian god and a, an argument against them so again I, 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 there, there's a strong correlation there um the wall of the fire behind the gate represents the gates of heaven i'm not so sure about that to be honest fire and brimstone typically denotes a more uh, hellish environment yeah, it's just that icon, I, I, iconic gates and fire, very bright fire light, things like that. It was it was evocative, you know. It's definitely evocative of of that sort of of climate and stuff. At ten forty, uh, according, and this is at ten minutes forty seconds. According to the words of the Bible, you do not choose whether you want to be God or not. The sole criteria for getting to heaven is whether you believe in Jesus or not. Beliefs are not something you choose. Uh, as an exercise, try to force yourself to believe that Granny Smith apples are capable of complex math or that your table is actually a television. Um, it, so so I, I may be misunderstanding this point, but I'm going to take my best stab at it or whatever have you. Uh, you're saying, according to the words of the Bible, you do not choose whether you want to be with God. The sole criteria for getting to heaven is whether or not you believe in Jesus um, Jesus or not. Beliefs are not something you choose. Right. Basically, in order to get into heaven, you can't just choose to go into heaven directly. Right. Um, though I don't know why you'd want to anyways, if you don't put your faith in God. The criteria is that you put your faith in God and his son, Jesus Christ. And putting your faith, as I mentioned in my video, is more than simple belief. Right. The devil believes that God exists, but he doesn't put his faith in God. OK. Um, I believe my wife exists, but I have to put my faith into her uh, in order to, you know, let her access to my money and everything else like that. So things like that represent faith. You have to put your faith truly in God. Now, I don't know why you'd want to enter into heaven if you didn't have faith in God, because he is an all-powerful being. His his essence is everywhere there. All the blessings of heaven are directly tied into him. So saying you don't want to, you know, have your faith in him, you don't trust. It's like me saying, I completely completely have no trust in my wife. I don't want to put my faith in her, but I'm willing to live in the same house. I want to be in her house that, that we've worked on together and, um, and, and enjoy the benefits of this house, but live in this, live with this, this, this lady who I don't trust with my money. I, I don't have any faith in her. I don't trust her with my money. I don't trust her with my life. I don't trust her with anything. That doesn't quite make sense. When your faith completely breaks down in somebody, you just want to leave them. Even if it's, even if it's painful, you want to leave them. And most of the atheists I've known who I've had deep conversations with really hate the idea of a Christian God so much. And they've told me this to my face over and over again, countless times. They don't care what happens. They would rather be apart from the Christian God than be in heaven with him, even if that means going to some sort of hell they don't believe in or whatever have you. Uh, I had uh, just actually one of my parents tell me that not too long ago. It's 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 a very strong feeling that that these people uh, will will tend to have against God. So generally speaking, I don't know too 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 many people who kind of want to be in a heaven and not and and not want to be with God anyway. So it's kind of go together like this when you think about it. So God isn't being cruel or capricious or anything by saying if you don't put your faith in Him, you're not going to be in heaven. You're going to be separated in a place. Um, reserved for the, the you know the eternally damned 
Uh, let's see, 12 minutes, 30 seconds. Whether Jesus is God and the nature of the Trinity are not small details of the disagreement. They are fundamental disagreements. So the Trinity is something that the vast, vast, if you're talking about the, the, the essence of the Trinity and the idea of the Trinity, it's beyond the scope of really what I'm getting into in this video, but the vast, vast majority of Christian uh, churches and stuff actually agree on Trinity, Trinitarianism, even though it's not really spelled out in the Bible and stuff. I personally do not believe that you have to believe in the Trinity to be saved. The idea of the Trinity, the idea that God is three and one, three separate or whatever have you. There is definitely a lot of people who disagree with me and they do feel, when I mentioned the state and the country lines before, there are people who believe those are country lines those are and not state lines. And that's their prerogative to to believe that. Some people believe if you disagree with them about the uh, idea of women being pastors or women wearing uh, pants in church versus dresses or baby baptism, but that's that, that means you're not a Christian or, or whatever have you. Now, the Bible does talk strongly about these particular uh, dis types of disagreements and how we should approach them as Christian, but we don't all follow those words perfectly. So we will divide ourselves into denominations sometimes so much so that we'll even say maybe they're not truly christian okay um and and jesus warns about this stuff paul warns about this stuff here's the thing christians aren't perfect but that doesn't change god's word the gospel message is very very simple and easy to understand and you don't have to believe in trinitarianism or not to get into heaven you just need to have your faith in jesus christ and if you believe in let's say modalism while that's considered heretical by most churches that's not going to send you to hell and i challenge anybody to find me the passage that says modalism and believing in modalism which is that god has three different modes somehow sends you into hell as an aside how could a perfect being could not produce a perfect book that is no ambiguity in the fundamentals and the message okay so if a guy is carrying a map and he's holding it upside down and he never gets to his destination, he complains about the map. Is it the map that's wrong or is it the map user who's wrong, right? People are fundamentally flawed, selfish, and evil on the inside. So the book can be perfect, but they are coming to it with, with lenses over their eyes. Jesus talked about these skills in people's eyes that fundamentally blurs our message. This wallpaper that I have on my computer screen here uh, that I'm showing you today, so you don't have to have my face blown up here. Um, some would say this is a beautiful piece of artwork. They could even say it's perfect. It's a very gorgeous piece of artwork, right? But here's the thing. Um, my eyesight is kind of fuzzy. I've got not the best eyes in the world, so I don't see it perfectly. And so if I start calling out things about it um, and describing it, it doesn't mean the picture's not perfect. It means my eyesight is messed up sometimes. A true God would have had no minor details on which it is okay to interpret at your own leisure or where preference. It's your opinion, right? Um, uh, and that's that's fair of you to to have that opinion, uh, and that that you think that there would be no no arguments in a perfectly biblical world that these people with their with their eyesight, you know, kind of messed up or their morality messed up would not bring different interpretations to the Bible. The thing is. The Bible itself talks about this particular problem over and over again um, about people, you know, basically interpreting things the wrong way, many times for their own selfish means, whether they were doing it consciously or unconsciously, but their own sinful nature was leading them to interpret God's words in different ways, often in bad directions. Uh, but that's why we have to continue to study. We need to meditate on God's word. That's why we need to pray. That's why we need to talk to each other as iron sharpens iron to have a better understanding of God's word. It's not because his word isn't perfect. It's because our understanding of it is going to be terribly flawed because like my eyesight, our ability to absorb spiritual truth through a, a, a lens is going to be flawed uh, through the lens of our own thing. I'll be right back after this. Okay, I am back, this time with a different wallpaper. I'm going to use Curse of Strahd. I do like to play Pathfinder, which is an offshoot in Dungeon Dragons. And I play a lot of D&D &D back in the past, so I have these, these wallpapers up from time to time. All right, so... Let's see here. Uh, thousands uh, at 14 minutes, his comment says, thousands of people were literally executed for using a freedom of speech that did not exist in early and mid years of the religious existence. The freedom of speech we have today stems from outside uh, religious practice. Um, I, I I don't really know what that has to do with the with the price of tea in China. I was using. I was just using the argument of explaining states and countries, how 
in the religion, in the Christian religion world, there are denominations that have minor differences between them. But then when you go to like, let's say outside of the, let's say most uh, Christian religions and you go to something like Islam, you know, or whatnot, then you have entirely different sets of rules. And people who are a little bit less educated in all of the theology, the differences between the different religions, Hinduism, Christianity, et cetera, et cetera, they kind of think they're all very similar. So Christianity's lumped in with all these other religions um, and whatnot, especially since, again, there's 40,000 different denominations or whatever there is of Christianity. And that's where I made the, the states versus the lines. And I kind of use the, the fact that in the United States, you have freedom of, of speech, but in other, a lot of other countries you do, you do not. Uh, for whatever reason and whatnot. I wasn't necessarily making an argument that this was, that freedom of speech in and of itself is more Christian, not Christian, hyster, historicity of freedom. I wasn't going there. I wasn't going there. It's a whole nother conversation. I was just simply using it as an illustration of the denominations of Christianity. The vast majority of them, not all of them, but the vast majority of them are basically like going from one state to the other. You're going to find some minor variations in the world, but nothing that speaks directly to the heart of the gospel message, which is having faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ uh, alone uh, in his blood being shed being the total atonement for your sins uh it, it's not through your own works or anything along those lines uh, it is purely through faith in jesus christ that is the heart of the christian message that we've all sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of god uh we all have to face judgment to pay you know to pay that price uh just like with real law it doesn't matter how many good deeds you've done if you've broken the law if you stole it from people or heaven forbid you've shot somebody it doesn't matter how many good deeds you've done you're going to jail uh, you're going to pay a price, and the price you pay is in direct proportion with who you offend a lot of times. If you punch another person, you're going to jail maybe. If you punch the President of the United States, you're, you're going to get locked up for a very, very long time, right? So uh, when you offend, at, when you perform sins against the creator of the universe, that's even higher. So you got to consider all these things. Excuse me. you got to consider all these things, but the reality is we've all sinned countless times. And the Bible makes it very clear that the wages of sin are death, e eternal death. So um, uh, that that's why God sent Jesus on the cross to die for us, so that none should have to perish uh, if you put your faith in him. If you're willing to repent <clears throat> and, and turn towards him, then there is a path there for you. Because otherwise, again, none of your good deeds can ever pay off what you've done. The price has to be paid. That's just Justice 101. And so, uh, but God believes in substitutive justice, and he, he put his son on the, on the cross to die for us. 17 minutes. He demonstrates holiness by how he executes justice. Going by the criteria set in Romans and John about the involved burning people in a lake of fire for eternity for the sole crime of not believing personally, I can't think of a crime that would warrant eternal punishment in any form, let alone the most painful form imaginable. Um, well, I would definitely have to disagree with you there. If somebody comes in, and punches my wife, I want them to go to jail. If they do, there are much worse things than punching a woman, I want them to go to jail big time. And heaven forbid they kill my wife. Murder is a thing. It happens all the time. It's happened since the Stone Ages. Cain and Abel, if someone murders my wife, I'm going to want them to be electrocuted or something. Like, I I'm going to be very, very upset inbuilt in all of us is a desire for justice it's really interesting because a lot of us don't really think about this until somebody truly harms us directly or worse yet one of our loved ones or whatever have you and we really want to see justice carried out now in america you generally can't go even if someone shot your wife you can't go and shoot them that's vigilantism or whatever have you you have to leave it to the law and that's why we have the American justice system. So we, we hope we have a great justice system that's going to go after these people, lock them up, put them away, and, and carry out the justice that we are not supposed to do ourselves um, and whatnot. There's different justice systems. Some, some justice systems let you go out and do that. We don't get to do that in America. We have a justice system that is supposed to be more objective, takes the emotion out of it, a judge makes the decision for us, and we all agree mostly in this country that that's a good thing, that we have a an objective detached judge who will look at the facts along with the jury will look at all the facts objectively not being emotionally involved and will determine if that criminal or if that person i should say committed a crime and then give them the due punishment due for that crime
Okay. Now, um, you're saying, oh, okay, your argument, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to misrepresent you here. Your argument is that you don't understand anything that could warrant eternal punishment uh, in any form, uh, much less something the most pain, painful form imaginable or whatever have you. That's because you're not God, okay? So God is more loving than you could ever imagine. No matter how loving you think you are to your family, to your pets, to other people, God makes you look very hateful by comparison. He's extremely loving. He was willing to send his son to die on the cross on our behalf. And he shared that pain with Jesus. He, he hurt so much, he turned his back on Jesus during that time. And Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? It was very, very painful for the both of them because he had to watch his son die, which was you know, very, very excruciating um, and whatnot. God loves us that much and then some. He is long-suffering, he's loving, he's caring. His ways are so far above ours that that's probably just the tip of the iceberg of how much he loves us. But he's also more holy than us. We can't think of crimes as being so offensive that they warrant eternal punishment. But God is justice is much higher than ours. His view is from a much different perspective than ours. Understanding God is impossible, thoroughly, is impossible for us. It's like a child trying to truly understand all the experiences and understandings of their parent. Their parents just got so many more years on them and whatever have you. It's not the best analogy in the world because eventually the child will grow and be able to see things in a manner speaking similar to their parents, right? But we can never grow enough to truly understand God's ways. And his ways are much further apart than a child, uh, than the parent is to the child. So uh, that's probably why you can't envision that. And that's okay. I can't quite envision it either, but I have you know, faith that, that God has this perspective that I don't have. The thing is, when you sit there and say, assuming that there's a God for a minute, you accept this argument for a minute, and assuming that there's a God for a minute, and you're going to say, well, I will never believe in God because of the way he handles punishment. You are putting yourself above God in that respect. If you assume that God exists, um, you are putting yourself in the position of being above God. You are judging God. And that's a very big problem. It's you know, the Ten Commandments, but you are you are you are creating your own deity system. You're creating your own deity. You're creating what you think God should be, and that's what you're going to set up and follow in your life. One of the uh, Christian arguers, I forget his name, makes this argument all the time. You're you're serving something. You are serving someone, whether it's your own ideal, uh, your own ideals, which is in essence worshiping yourself and following yourself, or you're following a different deity. But this is what you're doing here. So kind of keep that uh kind of keep that in mind so the first question really needs to be is the christian god the biblical god is 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 that real is 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 he real and 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 you got to be able to accept the idea of course that if you find out he is real that you're going to have to uh, uh, accept his ways and put your that's what me, means putting your faith in somebody i don't always understand why I'll use the analogy of my wife again. I don't understand why she always does some of the things that she does. And some of the stuff, if it was somebody else, might worry me. But my faith, I have faith in her. So even if she's doing something that looks a little suspicious, I have complete faith in her. Uh, so uh, even with God, I will not say that I completely understand all of his ways, but I have faith in him. With that being said, the best, uh, the, the best uh, argument I have for this that, you know, is is when you when you raise your fist to God in the heavens and you go against your creator that's a much higher and you sin against him that's much 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 higher <laughs> than if you were to sin against another person or the president of the United States so higher higher crime now some people argue that the punishment is for all eternity some people just say it's actually just destruction so you don't suffer for all eternity you're just turned off like a like a light bulb which point there's there's no suffering but that, that's a whole nother video and, and i don't really have a, a super strong um, opinion on that particular one i i just figure something you probably don't want to want <laughs> either way let's see at 18 minutes 50 seconds you say speak for yourself on that one i have never sinned in my life unless you count my expectation of evidence to form my beliefs evidence that has yet to be provided you have never sinned really Okay, well, generally speaking, you, you, you know, that's an attitude that a lot of Americans have. If I go up and ask them, do you think you're a good person? Most of them will say they're good. So then I'll ask them questions like, hey, 
do uh, do have you ever stolen from anybody, regardless of how small? I can tell you I have. What does that make me? It makes me a thief. Okay. Have you ever lied to anybody at all? I have. That makes me a liar. Um, have you ever murdered anybody? Well, of course not. I've never murdered anybody. But you see, Jesus spoke about this subject, and he said, if you look, if you if you yell at your brother in anger and you call him an idiot or something along those lines, you've committed murder in your heart. That's how holy God is. That even when we lash out at somebody verbally. To, to God because he's so sensitive he's so sensitive to holy issues and stuff like that and his ways are much higher than ours and you're you are verbally abusing out of anger one of his children because we're all his children we are all princes and princesses and whatever in his sight you are committing murder in your heart <laughs> Jesus standard is high God's standard is high you know we set these very low standards for ourselves we're like well I didn't commit anything that got me put in prison I'm a good person God's standards are much higher than whether or not you've been in prison or not or done something worthy of being thrown in prison. God's ways are much higher than ours. So, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've said and I've said a lot by my own admission. I'm a lying, thieving murderer, and there's like 10 other or seven other commandments to go through, uh, like honoring your parents. Boy, have I dishonored my parents on more than an occasion or two. So, yeah, no, we've all sinned. And falling short of the glory of God. You can come up with your own 10 best rules in life for a good person. Generally speaking, most people have broken at least one of those at least one point in their life. And if we're honest, we've broken any rule set we come up with many, many, many times. Um, that's, you know, even by our own low standards, we probably have, most of us would, would agree that we have, we have committed sins. And remember, no matter how many good deeds you do, it doesn't offset the fact that you still have this debt you've accrued. You can't outdo the bad deeds with good deeds. You can't tell the police officer who pulled you over for speeding that you've driven the speed limit your entire life and you promised to do it. He's going to give you a ticket anyways. That's just the way it is. And if you run over a, a kid in a school zone, your butt's going to prison no matter how many years of safe driving you've had and how many years you promised to have it. And that's what we want. We don't want people to be given free handouts and stuff, uh, free, free uh, hand wavings and stuff. We want justice to be carried out when somebody hits their kid in a school zone. All right, 20 minutes, 40 seconds. But if he created the earth, then it did not need to have these evil things that, were, that we are glad to get away from. If this God created both heaven and earth, with heaven having no evil within it, then you're saying that creating such an existence is possible and that he could have excluded evil, famine, and pain from his initial design. Uh, that that is that is quite possible. Uh, in fact, that's what we imagine heaven sort of might be. I, I don't know. The, the Bible doesn't go into a depth of detail of all of God's motivations. A common Christian response that I've seen from a lot of people about this is that is that you can't have love without choice. So if you have a world where it's a perfect world like heaven and people don't sin against each other. Right, because pain is caused by us sinning. Even if the world had no disease, no nothing, no death, uh, which was a result of our sin, by the way. But but let's just take that off the table for a minute to simplify the argument. Uh, then then uh, then you j just have these people who are living in this perfectly healthy environment with perfect air conditioning and light and food. But the problem is, as soon as they lie, they steal, they hurt each other, they hit whatever. That become that starts turning heaven into hell. Um, and turning it more into earth. God, of course, can create us to be perfectly moral, upright beings that follow his will at all times. At that point, what you have is what some Christian theologians would argue is at that point you have a robot. And love only exists where there's choice. So we put Adam and Eve in the, in the Garden of Eden, and we give them a simple commandment to not eat the apples, and they can make that choice. And if they obey God, that's a demonstration of their love for God. You you follow when somebody, I, I love my wife, when she tells me to put the toilet seat down, I demonstrate my love by keeping the toilet seat down, so to speak. If I'm constantly just disregarding what she says, it, it might show that I don't love her as much as I say I do. So that is like the first step. Um, 
so on and so forth. So we live in this world where we're allowed to make our own decisions within limitations. We can't just decide, I don't want to be on Earth anymore. I'm going to go fly to the moon. Uh, I want to live for 200 years. I can't make certain decisions. Certain things are out of my control, but I do get to make a lot of ethical decisions every single day within the limitations that God has set forth in our in our humanity here on Earth. And I can choose whether or not to follow God and to love him or to hate him as part of that subset of things that I'm allowed to do. And, and that's how, that's where love can flourish because if I have no choice, then I have no love. That's a typical Christian argument. Now, I, I, I think it's a good argument. I don't think it's a perfect argument. And I don't think I think I don't think the Bible really lays all of this out. I'm kind of careful when I need to be in terms of of not making arguments for the Bible when the Bible doesn't make the arguments. The Bible doesn't necessarily go into the details of why God does every single thing he does. It is going to point out that he has the right to create the things the way that he wants to in his way. And we don't really get a lot of right to question him on it. So that is a harder thing for Christians to say to non-believers because immediately most non-believers are going to be like, well, there we go. He's an evil, horrible God. I, you know, he, he, how dare he? Just because he created us, which is exactly the argument made in that Stargate. You know, like if, if, if you, just because you have these powers, you can create people or plant them or whatever it may be. You don't have the, the, the right to dictate all their, and we're, we're so independently thinking or maybe that's not the right word i don't mind being independently thinking i'm a independent thinker myself i don't even go to a church but um but we are so full of ourselves that that we can't even conceptualize following a god unless our opinions line up with his in terms of how this stuff should go down so and that kind of segues very well to your next point, 22 minutes, zero seconds. Be very, very careful, all capital letters. You are essentially giving people a reason to unalive children to save them from suffering. Again, remembering the verses cited above, this would not bar said person from also going to heaven if they clearly believe in Jesus. So um, I think I made myself very clear. God has the right to determine when to take our lives or not. We do not. God does, we do not, okay? And God cannot be fooled. So if you say, I'm going to go kill a bunch of children and immediately turn my faith to God, <laughs> you can't play God like that. He sees your heart. He sees exactly what you're doing. He sees exactly what you're laying down, and he will not be played like a fiddle. You can't do that. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a straw man argument. Because the Bible makes it very, very clear that God knows a man's heart. And anybody who tries to game the system, so to speak, in such a way will just find hell waiting for him. That's simply not a thing. Now, with that being said, there has been murderers in the Bible who have repented, including King David and Paul, who murdered you know, people and then eventually repented. And, uh, and, and, King, and David was somebody who believed before, then murdered and then repented, whereas, of course, Paul is an unbeliever, murder people out of that unbelief as part of his job doing what he was doing. And then, you know, he had a little visit from from the higher ups and he 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 repented immediately and ended up working the rest of his life to spread the gospel message. God can forgive all sins, and that includes murder. There's a lot of fake religions out there that says God never forgives murder. And that, you know, we're just like, yeah, if you kill another person, you shouldn't be forgiven for that at all. If you kill children, you kill, you should never be forgiven for that at all. And, and sure enough, murder is a very serious sin in the Bible. People have been stricken down like that, dead by God, judged right away for such things. It is extremely serious offense. But the blood of Jesus Christ forgives even murder. But again, if you're playing the game and you're like, yeah, I'm going to get away with murdering so much and then I'm going to, I'm going to. You know, repaint it. He's not fooled. It's not fooled in the least. Now, uh, if somebody says, I killed all these children because I believed in God, he told me to do it. I don't think that's going to stop any government from doing what they normally do to people who kill children. And it shouldn't. Uh, and whatever have you. So there you go. If God really told him to kill the, 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 the children, uh, which he did with the Israelites, right? 
he protected the Israelites because they were doing exactly what he told them to do. And he had something better for those children waiting on the other side. But again, that's God's prerogative to make that decision. And if you are truly following it, you, he will, he will uh, follow through on that. But that's not a, a really a thing we've seen in a very, very long time. If the Gospels are so easy to understand, why are there over 1,000 different denominations derived from the same text? Uh, I've heard 40,000. I'll take 1,000. I'll take any number in between. It's like I said before. You can have a perfect text, but you have people who have their flawed eyesight. You have people who have flawed morality. You know, I could sit there out of the goodness and kindness of the most, the most uh, good reasons in the world and come out and say, do not murder people. And if I if I'm God, thou shall not murder. And people will find a way to pigeonhole that and interpret that differently. And da, 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 you know, it, it could go it could go all, all over. So people are imperfect, uh, and that's putting it nicely. Putting it more realistically, people are evil. Evil. Jesus said this all the time. You kept reading the, uh, the the old rules of God. He talked about the Pharisees, but your hearts were so hardened that you interpreted it the completely wrong way, and you are totally going against what my Father taught. You've created traditions that break His rules because you're so evil. Okay, so and and we tend to think, oh, well, that only applies to the Pharisees because they're ha 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 evil, but it applies to us as well if we're realistic with ourselves. We are wicked and selfish. I am wicked and selfish. I'm very self-centered uh, and whatnot. It's part of, of, of my nature and it's something I keep slipping into over and over again. So it's something that I have to constantly keep addressing. So, all right, we'll continue answer some more questions uh, or some points. At 23 minutes, 30 seconds, again, you or the people you are debating in this instance misunderstand belief. It's not a choice. If they believe parts of the Bible is true but have issues with certain passages, then what you have is a refusal of worship, not a refusal of belief. I think I, I try to be very clear on this. I'll, I'll try it again. Um, belief is different than faith. You have to have your faith in Christ. You can't just simply believe in Jesus Christ. I, don't, I, I try not to use that word too often. Maybe I've slipped into it in the last video too often. I try to use the word faith because, again, Satan believes in God. Satan doesn't put his faith in God, right? He doesn't have faith in God. He refuses, to your point, he refuses to worship God. He worships himself, period. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I've never argued otherwise, not intentionally anyway. So if I had a slip, I apologize. But I make it very clear uh, and whatever have you. And if they have problems with certain passages, look, even Christians struggle with passages. Even even I struggle with passages. I don't want to believe everything that's in there. I I, I, I do, but I have my faith in God. Uh, that that's the big difference here. I I don't like everything that I see in there. I have faith that when I die, some of these objections that I have are going to get answered. Some of these questions that I have will hopefully get answered, right? But and 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 I don't I don't I don't expect them to all get answered the way. That makes me exactly happy because God's ways are not my ways. When my parents would tell me, hey, you got to go to the dentist. I hated going to the dentist. It was always painful, right? Uh, and, 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 but I, you know, as an adult now, I understood short-term pain for long-term healthiness and stuff like that. Uh, that's something that when you, when it's revealed to you, okay, now I understand. I think some things about God, we're going to see that way. We're going to see that those early deaths were more like dental visits, <laughs> short-term pain for maybe long-term benefit for those people who are truly, you know, innocent, like maybe babies or whatever have you who were passed into the afterlife early. And we're going to say, you know what, that wasn't wrong of him at all. That was a, that was wonderful of him. They didn't have to go through some of the things we went through. So good on him. Um, other things, I, I think it's just going to be like, you know what my parents would teach me hey um you have to you have to uh do uh you have to pay taxes or, or whatever have you well uh they taught me that was a teenager i thought it was stupid then i still think it's stupid today at least half of the things i pay taxes for i simply don't agree with the way the government spends my money but it is something i've had to accept as an adult and move on and just have to keep my faith in the american government that overall this is better than the alternative now uh, this is probably not the best analogy in the world, but God's ways are above our ways. And I do think there's going to be some things that maybe it's going to be really hard for me to accept even when I'm up there or whatever have you. So 
uh, I'm going to have to, you know, deal with that when I get there, but I have my faith in him anyway. So that's, again, that's a huge part is a whole huge part of becoming a Christian is putting your faith completely into him and you don't understand everything. Maybe you don't agree with everything. Maybe you have strong emotions against some of the things that are taught in the Bible. You really, really do. But you have your faith in, 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 in Jesus Christ because you realize at the end of the day, you're a sinner. You have this great debt to God. You can't escape from it. He died and bled for you and he is your creator. And because of these reasons, you lay it all at the cross, even though you don't understand it all. Now, it doesn't mean you can't ever understand it. We can continue to study God's word. And that's why there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of, of pages and hours of videos and stuff going into definer points of theology to help people understand better and better. And I'm not your biggest person for being able to teach some of that very well. There are resources out there. You can start that journey now. But I personally don't need to have every single question answered to my satisfaction because of my faith in, in, in him. Sending to your son to suffer and die, he says at 25 minutes, 40 seconds, sending your son to suffer and die is a loving response. I want no part of this love. Thank you. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Doing the right thing often costs. It hurts. Anybody can love when it doesn't hurt. Like if you're in a relationship with a spouse and they're loving you and you're loving them, everything's all hunky-dory, right? That's a that's a nice kind of love. Everyone, everyone's down with that. But then one day your spouse gets very, very sick and they're in bed for many months, needing constant bed care, throwing up on the floor. You got to clean it up. None of this is happy. None of this is fun, but you're there with them every step of the way. Sacrifice It's stressful to you. It's a lot of backbreaking work. It's a lot of emotional toll. You could just run away and go and get into a new relationship. You could do that, but that'd be the coward's way out. The loving way is to is to serve is, is to serve that person. Another uh, example is is World War II. You know, Nazi Germany was taking over all of Europe. We had to take a stand, or that was going to eventually come over and take over our country. Our fathers sent their sons to die in Europe. They did a very loving thing. It was hard. It was harsh. It was real. And those sons did a very brave thing in dying to protect their country. God sent his son to die for our sins because a price has to be paid for justice because God is holy and can't just hand wave his justice because it feels good. That wouldn't be a good judge. If we had a judge system where somebody comes into court after running over a kid in a school zone and the judge says, do you promise to be better from now on? Okay, we'll let you off the hook. The people over there on the other side of the courtroom wouldn't believe very much in that justice system, the ones who had their kid run over. Um, so God sends his son to pay for our debts in our place. Blood, ha His blood was spilled so our sins could be washed away. Um, let's see. Enlightenment is not the goal at all. Correct. Blind faith is as demonstrated again by the above passages. I um, feel like there's probably a little bit more context missing there or whatever have you. But when I say faith in God, I mentioned in the last video, it doesn't mean blind faith, of course. I have faith in my wife. It's not a blind faith because of the good things she's done for me, the years we've had together. I have a strong faith in her. When she does things I don't understand, I don't immediately just break off and stop believing in her because I have this faith in her uh, would be kind of it. Uh, but it, God encourages us to study and show ourselves approved. There's the whole entire Bible he's given us so that we can study theology. And there's plenty of riches in the Bible, uh, plus thousands of pages written by other people that we can read that help us to understand things better, discussions we can have, videos we can watch, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, Christianity is very much a thinking religion, but faith faith is, is not an antithesis of understanding and knowledge and whatever have you. Uh, people assume blind is synonymous with faith. Like you gotta have a blind faith. There's just no way to tear these two words across apart. That's just simply not true. 2745, Jesus paid for our sins and we are no longer inherently born with them. Babies still die at birth um, and whatnot. So a whole branch of theology about whether he died for all sins in the world or, or just the sins of those who put their, their, their faith in them and whatnot. So the wages of sin are both a physical death and an eternal eternal death and whatever have you. Uh, the eternal death is a big one. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're born again, your spirit is born again, and it never dies. So you never experience a spiritual death. The physical death uh, from our 
from our flesh such as it is very imperfect and it falls apart after 70 years or so uh, that's still a part of where we are we are at in this world with all the diseases and everything else that is a result of the overall state of sin in the world and it's something every person pretty much has to go through 28 30 and 29 you can absolutely change your mind but you're not going to do it with anything less than solid evidence theists often respond to this with words that thou shalt not put thy lord thy god to the test um so i like what ravi zacharias said he put enough in this uh enough into this world to where i'm going to paraphrase here because i don't remember the quote exactly but he basically said he put enough into this world to where you can reasonably believe in god but left enough out to where you know you can have these um you can you can definitely uh find enough reasons to not believe in him as well if god came out of the sky and said boom i am here believe in me okay that might get everyone to believe. It may not. But let's say for sake of argument, because in order for this to be what you're asking for, probably what I've heard from atheists before, it would need to be effective. So for sake of argument, we're going to say this is like a big booming voice that really gets everybody on their hands and knees. We kind of go back to that argument again, where if you're forced like that, you know, they're through whether it's some sort of irrefutable demonstration of power or whatever it may be, that you're not really making a, a choice. God has given us a world where we have plenty of evidences of his glory. We have the mountains, the nature, the hills, the baby, you know, babies being born, uh, the, 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 the wonder of life all around us and nature all around us. And the fact that science, you know, a lot of arguments that I hear is, well, science explains all of that nowadays. And what we don't know, we're going to figure out soon enough. So it's not really miraculous. Just because, you know, there were Christian scientists in the past who never saw their pursuit of figuring out how biology works as somehow meaning we're going to figure out God and therefore we don't believe in him anymore. Understanding the things that God has put together for us and exactly how they're ordered and structured and they feed into one another uh, and the order of creation and the laws of physics and all of that. Christian scientists see that as a way of understanding God even better because again, God is a God of, of study. So, uh, and showing yourself study to show yourself approved and all of that. So, they could they they saw this as getting closer to god not as getting apart from him, just because you understand how these things move in order and whatever have you uh so there is a lot of evidence from a christian perspective there's a ton of evidence for god a ton but it's not so ironclad shut in your face you have no other choice but to believe no 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 in fact if you don't want to put your faith in god you you have plenty of excuses not to I need to find that quote from Ravi Zacharias. I do. Um, 32 minutes. Uh, faith absolutely means what you said it does not. Non-blind faith is not faith at all. Non-blind faith is not faith at all. It is knowledge because you now have evidence. Now, I've explained this already numerous times about, you know, how I have faith in my wife, uh, and that is uh, partially built uh, to a large extent based off of our 20-some years together and a pattern of behavior. But it is not ironclad evidence that she is going to not change her mind in the future and stab me in the back or do something like that, right? We, we hear stories all the time about how someone's faith in their spouse after 20 years of marriage was betrayed when they went out and cheated on them or, or whatever have you. Thankfully, God doesn't do that to us. But uh, that faith in that person up to that point would say, I have faith in my spouse, uh, but that's without ironclad evidence that they're not going to change their behavior in the future. It's not, you know, and I don't have ironclad evidence that there wasn't cheating somehow in the past. Maybe, maybe, maybe she cheated on me and, and got away with it, right? So, you know your wife loves you because she shows it. Once shown to be true, it is no longer faith but knowledge. Um, but it's not a perfect knowledge at all. Faith fills in the gaps if nothing else because, again, I don't know about the things that I don't know about in the past. Just like I say, I don't know all the answers for God and all the questions for God. So, I have faith, uh, you know, I put my faith in him. Now, even if, let's say, I had all of the evidence for God to believe in him, I think faith even goes above this particular conversation because I could theoretically have all of the knowledge about God somehow stuffed into my you know, brain and, and have all this stuff about him. And maybe I, I even agree with all of his viewpoints. It's still a different matter entirely for me to put my faith into him completely. Just because he's creator, just because all this stuff is logical, I, humans aren't logical beings. Satan had all of this evidence in front of him about God, 
and certainly knew God better than anybody else, but still fell away from God, still made a decision to walk away from God, still made a decision to stop putting his faith in God and decide to follow his own way. So faith and belief are two different things, and it's not really connected at, uh, all that strongly with knowledge, uh, you know, and whatever have you. Why are biblical scholars necessary if there is no ambiguity? I've already explained that several times because we're, we're sinful and we have this very fuzzy vision and whatever have you, so, uh, and whatnot. So one, one thing is like, for example, you know, we, we don't we don't have microscopic vision, we don't have telescopic vision, we have things to help us understand and see things about the universe better with the with the proper tools and whatever have you. And then we have to have lots of discussions to even though the, the picture, once we get a microscope or a telescope and we can see perfectly what the universe looks like, uh, so the picture of the universe is perfect, you know, through those lenses, we still have to have discussions as to what they mean. So again, the map can be perfect. We still need we still need to have some discussions on what those represent, particularly in lieu of the fact that the telescope analogy falls down because we don't have when it comes to morality because we're inherently sinful. We do not have a perfect telescope, so to speak. Capricious might dis oh I'm sorry uh, Cop uh, Copernicus might disagree with you. Uh, 34 minutes 15 seconds, as would many other people in the dark ages of Christianity. Um, I don't know exactly what that refers to, so I'll just keep moving on. Apologies, but you have Stargate and Atheism as part of the same sentence in your title. It was always going to get my attention, and this scene is one of my top three scenes in the entire franchise, and you are and you invite a debate. No, you don't have to apologize. These are great questions. Hopefully, we help to answer some other people's questions that maybe they had. If you if you have these points, other people have these points, it's good to kind of get those out there and, and discuss them from time to time, and, and I like to do that here in between talking other subjects, like I, uh, my channel here, and talk about Dungeons and Dragons, talk about video games, talk about whatever. Uh, but it's always good to, to have these conversations. Uh, like I said, I had an atheist friend who we had a discussion that kind of came up in discussing other things. This scene came up, so I thought it was a good time just to, just to show uh, a lot of people out there that uh, I'm not a scholar. I don't go to a church. I've never been to a seminary. I've read the Bible a, a few times. I've, uh, I've done my own study. I have, of course, read other papers, watched some videos on both from atheists and from other Christian speakers. So I, I do a lot of theology listening to in the background on my own time. And I just want to be able to demonstrate that there are some, some answers for some of these concerns that are brought up. It doesn't mean that Everyone's going to accept those 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 uh, perspectives, you know. Not everyone's going to buy into that. Certainly, very few of my relatives who've heard these uh, perspectives from me uh, on a few occasions uh, have not suddenly changed their mind and and have suddenly come around to my point of view or whatever have you. Uh, so I don't really think that putting these videos out there is suddenly going to wake a bunch of people up and suddenly they're gonna be like, well, well, that solved it for me, Phil. Uh, so. Well, yeah, with all that being said, I didn't think putting these videos out there would suddenly start changing people's minds or anything along those lines. But, uh, you know, answering your questions or answering some of your thoughts hopefully gives some other Christians some ways to respond to some of these questions. Uh, also, for some of you who maybe don't believe, maybe uh, you can appreciate the fact that there is a different perspective, even if you don't uh, necessarily agree with all of it and stuff. So... Hopefully, I, you know, having these conversations once in a while is a good thing. If you want to have uh, more conversations, I can't make videos like this every single day, sadly. Uh, I, I am busy preparing games for my players and, and doing my day job that pays the bills and everything. But uh, you're always welcome to leave comments down here. You can also uh, hit me up on Discord. I'm at JC Servant, and, and you can... Uh, uh, if you like to get on the line, I like to talk to people online while I'm doing chores and stuff like that, make the best use of my time, or, or sometimes when I'm doing my video game time, playing some EDF, Earth Defense Force, I'll talk with people. So you're more than welcome to hit me up on Discord uh, and whatnot. Be happy to, to chit chat with y'all some more if, if there wants to be some more conversation and what have you. Uh, but I'm glad I'm glad you guys like Stargate. Uh, thank you for writing in uh, those comments uh, to those of you who are passionate about the the series and the such. Uh, Mr. Fed Guy, I appreciate you very much for taking the time to write that in. Again, I like the series too. I like Star Trek, even though they both have messages that uh, arguments that are very strongly. Uh, in my opinion, very strongly uh, against uh, religion as a whole, with that humanistic message that always stands in stark contrast. I could do a video just on humanism and why it's it, it very much is, is 
anti-Christian uh, or, uh, you know, it, it definitely detracts from the Christian message. It is definitely, you can't, you can't hold a humanistic viewpoint and hold a Christian viewpoint uh, at the same time. They're just simply not com compatible at all. So, uh, but, but those, uh, you know, particularly Star Trek argues very, very strong for that humanistic, uh, humanism message. Uh, so I'm always happy to have those, those conversations from time to time as time allows. But uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, we'll hopefully have some more videos about this maybe in the future as time allows. Uh, maybe I'll, hey, maybe maybe maybe, maybe uh, somebody wants to send me another clip. Then maybe I'll have to do that and we'll start some more conversation along uh, along the lines as well. But thank you guys very much. Until next time, have a great day and may God bless you.